Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. On the agenda, we have several stock counters, including Land Lease Global Commercial REIT, um, Sun Power Group Limited, Comfort Dell Group, Propnex, Starhub, Sumco Marine, as well as Singapore Press Holdings. We'll wrap things up with our usual Singapore Weekly. Without further ado, we'll get started. Okay, so our first counter will be Land Lease Global, um, and this is their first quarter 2022 business update for the period ended uh, September 21. Okay, so there are no um, there are no financials for this uh, for this current operational update. Jumping right in, okay. On the positive side, three one three is bucking negative the negative reversion trend um, in the downtown malls. So five percent of NLA signed in the first quarter of twenty twenty two were signed at positive high single digit reversions, outperforming the ne negative reversions for downtown malls. This is a, this is an improvement. Uh, compared to the negative double-digit reversions signed in earlier quarters. Okay, so um, some of you may be curious as to why, um, how, how Lendlease managed to secure such high reversions. So this is because in earlier quarters, Lendlease uh, has been um, refreshing, refreshing its offering, um, its tenant mix, and so that this the new offerings that have been onboarded has sort of helped bring in more footfall as well as lifted tenant sales for the other tenants in the mall. So this actually resulted in tenants being more willing to renew their leases at higher uh, rates given the improvement in tenant sales. Okay. So overall tenant retention for this quarter was higher 90% versus 61.5% uh, in, in the previous quarter. Um, the next the next positive would be the high occupancy rate of 99.8% that has been maintained. And on the negative side, uh, first quarter 22 tenant sales uh, came in 3.1% higher quarter on quarter, but this is still 70 to 80% of 2019 levels. So this slightly improved um, tenant sales number was due to a shorter 2.5 week dining ban in the, in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, compared to five weeks in, in the earlier quarter. So overall, footfall also increased by about 10.4% uh, quarter on quarter. Uh, on, the next, on the outlook side, um, okay, so, so uh, Lendis is um, very optimistic about acquiring the remaining 68.2% stake in GEM. So in August and September of 2021, they increased their stake by 22.1%, bringing their, their, their stake in GEM to 31.8%. So okay, the management is uh, relatively optimistic and is in avid discussions to acquire the remaining stake of, Je of, of GEM from the remaining um, stakeholders. Okay, so once the, if and when um, this 100% stake has been acquired, then we can expect them to apply for tax transparency upon upon the successful acquisitions, and um, yeah, that will actually reap some tax savings. So just a quick update on Sky Complex. So Sky Complex is the other asset that is in Lendlease portfolio. It it uh, accounts for about thirty three percent of um the the NPI. So for this asset that is located in Italy, um, it is on a long lease, one hundred percent leased until May twenty thirty two. Um, there is, however, a lease break uh, option in 2024, um, and it requires one year notice period. So while there has been no um, lease break exercise, uh, we just want to point out that the in-place rents are currently about 30% below the market rents. So this actually means that there's actually potential upside for um, land lease should the tenant um, you know, break, their, break their lease. Uh, overall, we upgrade our call from neutral to accumulate, uh, raising our, our, our target price slightly from $0.87 cents to $0.97. Cents. Um, FY22 and FY23 DPU was raised by 8.6% and 7.7% on higher forecasted uh, contribution from GEM as well as Grange Road Car Park. Yeah, do note that this is also a change of analyst um, coverage. Okay, um, our, another factor that moved our target price would be the lower cost of equity assumption of 7.7%, uh, from, down from the previous 8%. So that's all for me. I'll now pass the time on to Vivian for Sun Power. 
Thanks, Natalie, and good morning, everyone. So this will be a flip on the ground for Sun Power's 3Q21 results. Um, referring to the next slide, the table on the top left is a snapshot of the results. I would like to clarify here that the 3Q20 and 9 month 20 results here are restated, meaning um, after the disposal of the MNS, which is manufacturing and services business, these figures um, do not include those results. So uh, firstly, for the key highlights, on a nine-month basis, the revenue is up 102%, and the operating pad me from continuing operations, which is from the green investments or the GI business, is up 45%. The 150 million RMB that you see here does not include the one-off expenses, including the administration expenses for the disposal of the MNS business, and also the special dividend um, from the disposal of the MNS business also. Yep. So um, you can see that the higher revenue for both 3Q and 9 month basis is mainly due to the higher steam sales volumes of around increase, which increased of around um, 20, 70%. But the gross margins have narrowed due to higher feedstock costs, mainly in the third quarter, which is also mainly due to um, higher coal prices. So if you refer to the chart, um, you can see that for the coal prices, the normalized levels of um, during when it was trending at around 2019 to 2020 period was around 500 to 600 RMB per ton. And in the first half of 2021 this year, the coal prices have already been trending upwards. But over the period of um, September to October, it surged to around 2,500 um, RMB per ton, which is almost a five to six times increase. And over the last 10 to 20 days, you can also see that the prices have steadily declined, even though it's still uh, twice of the so-called normalized levels, but it's already uh, much lower as compared to the peak um, prices. And um, movements of coal prices, moving on, would of course continue to depend on the government regulations. So for some power to protect their margins, they have raised steam prices quite a few times this year, but there is also this time lag with the pass-through mechanism to pass on 100% of the costs. And at the same time, they also continue to mitigate the high costs through using sludge as a substitute. And this is part of the circular economy model. So on the outlook, um, for some power, it remains very strong with additional contributions expected from the new plants and also current green investment projects or GI projects um, ramping up, including a few projects which are Shantou Project, Singtai Zhenda, and uh, Tongshan Projects, they are all expected to commence operations next year. And of course, this will continue to contribute to Sun Power's long-term recurring and high-quality income and cash flows. So that's all for Sun Power. Um, I'll now be passing the time on to Paul for Comfort Dell Group. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Hannah, um, for Comfort Dell Group, uh, uh, the title report is restructuring Wimper, but the cash rolling in. So the restructuring has been a disappointment, and but the operating cash flows remain uh, very strong, including the balance sheet. So uh, next slide. So in terms of the uh, the results first. So if you look at the results, the third quarter earnings was below. Uh, the nine month pet me is sixty percent of our full year forecast. Uh, the reason is because of the of the taxi rebates that continued into the third quarter. So if you look at the table, uh, you can see the, the in, there's, an, there's, an, there's an improvement, of course, by comparing against you know, uh, last year's peak of the restrictions. So it's still uh, loss-making. And if you ex exclude the relief and impair, I think the losses are still around $8 million. In terms of the positives um, the re from the results, the free cash flow generated was still very strong. They are, they're generating about $100 million this quarter. And the net cash continues to bulk up. So... Pre-pandemic, they were at the net debt level. Uh, then uh, last year, their net cash was hundred million. Then now the net cash is spiked up to almost uh, almost five hundred million. Uh, one, one of the reasons is because capital expenditure has dropped from around two hundred million the last two years to around to from you now three fifty million. Uh, so cash flows is the is the is the is was the positive on the results. Okay, the negatives was the continued restrictions. So also as a result, they had to give a twenty-five percent rebate, uh, uh, and and this actually will hit obviously hit the bottom line, 
uh, because it's a 25% off down the daily rental, maybe $100, $120. Uh, this will continue into November and they can't really give, like, there's no, no, there's no formula, like, how much. So it really depends on conditions, reopening, work from home situation. So the, as a result, as mentioned earlier, the taxi fell into losses. And the losses actually widened from last quarter's 2 million uh, loss. Okay, in terms of the outlook, uh, firstly, the downtown line has entered into transition into this NRFF, uh, the new rail framework, and it was a disappointment. So the, the, the reason why we expected this to be positive was because it would cap the losses, uh, because there was a, uh, there was a range where, where basically downtown line uh, margins, uh, I think the minimum margins was 3.5 and then maximum was I think 5%. Uh, uh, whereas right now, no, there's no protection. And number two, there, were, there was also supposed to be a protection and revenue in the revenue below the target. But there were three disappointments from this whole NRF too. So let me run through because it's a bit complicated. So the first one was uh, the losses from downtown line, uh, if there are, is kept to the service charge payable. So that's number one. We thought it was the protection will be higher, but it's only up to the service charge, which they mentioned was only up to 20 million. Uh, the second thing was uh, the, how they compute the losses. I, I'm just using, uh, actually it's called shortfall, in, uh, but assuming there's losses or shortfall, they don't calculate downtown line alone. So let's say downtown line is down for 40, 50 million, but they will actually offset it against maybe whatever profit that came out from Northeast line and, 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 the, and the LRT. So as a result, that is also contains the amount of, uh, of compensation the authorities or LTA will give them. So that's the second thing. The third disappointment was uh, advertising revenue was going to be taken back by the authorities. Uh, I mean, in a nutshell, basically, they had really little negotiation power with the authorities. So in the end, LTA will take back advertising in 2024. So these were the three negative uh, disappointments. I mean, net-net, there's still a benefit of about 15 million, uh, excluding the ad revenue by moving into this new structure, if you assume FY20's uh, uh, results. So net-net, there's still a, a 15 million benefit, but we thought it should have been higher. The next negative surprise was they announced, uh, you know, they have bus contracts. So the bus contracts basically, I mean, very simple, layman terms, uh, the authorities will just ask SBS to just, just drive the bus around. I mean, there's no passenger, so it doesn't matter, you can just drive it around and you're paid a service, um, a service fee. But they renewed five contracts and right now uh, the contracts actually, they extended it by three years, but now the authority is going to peg it to the latest bidding price and this will hit their service fee revenue by $3 million. Uh, Of course, we're not really sure. They don't really disclose the details of the thing uh, of the contract, whether by extending, you know, there's better scale on that. That one is unclear for us because they don't really share with us that. Uh. Okay, and, and the next thing was they announced the news that the Australian subsidiary IPO was halted due to challenging market conditions. And, and we all know what challenging market conditions means. Basically, they, they couldn't get the valuations they wanted, so, so they had to scrap the plans. Uh, we still maintain our, our buy, and, and our, our target price is down just a little bit. And let me explain a bit why, because you know, I was the DCF, so I was ultimately depends on the cash flow. So what has helped is that the capital expenditure, because we are using free cash flow as a DCF. So the because of their strong cash flow and strong balance sheet, that's why the our 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 DCF computation was only marginally impacted. Because whatever downside, maybe the 20, 30 million is offset by the you know, the savings of almost 100 plus million in capex. So uh the restructuring was definitely a whimper and it was a disappointment, but we, we still take it as our transport proxy for the Singapore's reopening and normalization of some social and work activities. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is very small because I'm just trying to throw in all the whole contract terms, but uh, uh, again, it's in the report, but just to share with you some key points. Uh, under the new thing, is like uh, real real advertisement has to be surrendered. Yeah, so sorry, the, the font might be a bit small because there's a lot and it's quite complicated. Uh, there are two parts to the sharing. One is revenue share and the third one, number three, is the EBIT caller. That means it's just a fancy name, cap and caller, just a range. You know? So long as you're within the range, the LTA won't intervene. But if you're outside the range, the LTA will take the tops, the upside and they will also share some of the downside. But I guess the sharing isn't that much. 
the other thing is the com that this one was a, the big surprise for us is the amendment of the five bus contracts. Um, so as a result, the fee they mentioned, the financial impact is there. Uh, the financial impact is thirty four million. Uh, the rest is just non cash. Uh, the rest is that some of these buses were actually owned by Comfort and and these were old news. These are legacy buses, uh, which which was eventually going to be be be, be, be kind of scrapped. Right? But right now the authorities just basically told them to scrap it earlier. Okay, uh, I'll move on. Uh, okay, anyway, sorry, the last one, just uh sorry, the back one. Uh you can see the financial impact on the left, the others, the number two financial impact. Uh, sorry again, the font is small. So the license they do get some savings of 20 million. Uh, but if you offset it against the operating loss from ad distance is 5.6. So net net they benefit about 15 million from the transition. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'll move on to pop next results. Uh, we titled it new altitude because the revenue run rate is moving from 100 million uh, per quarter. No, uh, and now this, they are trending at 200 and they kind of mentioned that they are quite comfortable at 200. No? Yeah, next slide. Uh, okay, in terms of the results, it's more or less in line. Uh, the pet, nine month pet me is about 72 of our full year forecast. So it's in line. Uh, in terms of the positives, I mean, there's really no negative and the earnings doubled. So, I mean, not, 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 nothing really much to, to say is negative. So, in terms of the positives, uh, revenue was up 100, it was doubled and it was broad based. So, uh, what we see is that uh, HDB volumes uh, has perked up uh, because, uh, of course, the government grants and HDB is also because of the delays in BTO construction, which I think APEC Realty also mentioned earlier, that's why we had a meeting. That you no, know, the delays are now almost five years, or so no, not many can wait so long. So, uh, uh, and the latest application, I don't know how many thousands of application com com compared to the supply. So a lot are shifting to BTO, and as a result, the, the that is helping the private res private resale and also the new launch. So the segment that's doing the best, you can see the table on the left is private resale. So the revenue for private resale triple. To 17 reason, million. And one of the reasons why resale is doing well is it's just mainly the price differential. So those who upgrade from HDB uh, because of the price and they want more space now. And, and actually, that's why landed is also doing very well because people are just scrambling for space. But anyway, uh, so because of the differential with new launch, uh, private resale is still doing uh, did the, the Fed the best. And this is considering the, you know, this third quarter, there's a lot of restrictions. So at most, a, a unit can only have two visitors, uh, but I guess the two visitors they quickly snap the the unit quite fast. So so even though there was a lot of restrictions for viewing, but the volumes were still uh, very strong uh, this quarter. Uh, uh, the next one is uh the also Popnext guided that they're going to pay more dividends. Uh, so last year the payout ratio which was seventy percent that means the seventy percent of the earnings is paid out as dividends, but this time round. They're going to move it to 75 to 80. So if you do the maths, uh, roughly, uh, it's, it implies a 13 and a half cent dividend or a, a final dividend of 8 cents and a full year dividend yield of about 7%. And I think the company continues to reiterate that they want to be a dividend paying stock. Uh, so in terms of cash flow, uh, so if you assume they pay 50 million, uh, this is more than enough because they're generating about uh, so far this year, they probably can generate 60. Uh, no, seven, 70, 80 million, uh, six, well, sorry, um, well, probably about 70 million cash flows per year. So more than enough to cover the 50 million dividend or, or this 13 and a half cents. And their net cash balance sheet continues to grow. I mean, right now they got like 123 million uh, net cash. Uh, they generated about 24 million this quarter. And just a reminder, you know, the, the CAPEX is hardly anything. They only spend like, 25,000 on capex uh, yeah probably some new computers for some new stuff i guess yeah so uh okay in, in terms of the outlook i think the momentum will still be there uh they will they were going to be the low interest rates the bto delay you know rising rising land and construction costs also means that uh, everyone will be uh, i mean the prices continue to rise i think now the the, the market expectations now is the the new mass market price should be around 2000 per square foot yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, and also the next one is the expanding agency force. So this year, they secured about 2,000 new agents uh, compared to last year, about uh, 1,000. So they doubled in terms of net ads. So right now, they have one third of the agents in the whole market right now. So, uh, so no change in our target price and, and, and so forth. Yeah, uh, next slide.
Oh, next thing. Next slide. Um, next slide should be startup. Yeah. Are we on the next slide? Sorry. Still on prop next. Oh, can we move on? To who, who's in charge of the? Yeah, it's me. Hold on. Uh. I, I can't seem to change the slide. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Can, can. All right. Uh, okay. So move on to the next one, which is uh, StarHub's results. Um, so in terms of results, is basically in line with our expectations. Uh, what has happened was the uh, cyber. Uh, sorry, the positive test actually cybersecurity. So, cybersecurity did very well. It jumped about uh seventy percent year on year to eighty million, and the profit spiked to doubled to 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 six million. Uh, so what is happening is that the run rate is actually moving from forty to seventy. So that's a positive. And and although I do know that there's a lot of volatility sometimes on the cybersecurity uh, revenue. But the underlying demand is strong for cybersecurity, as I guess we all intuitively would know that because there's consistent threats uh, and also cyber attacks and more, more and more are outsourcing to, uh, to cybersecurity specialists like themselves. Uh, most of their customers are you know, government-related agencies. Uh, the other thing positive was the broadband APU actually jumped 13%. You know, so, uh, the negative was the mobile is still weak because of the roaming. So just to give you some flavor, uh, pre-pandemic, the um, APU, which is the selling price for post was $40, and now it's only $30. So the difference is almost uh, almost entirely due to the roaming revenue. So in terms of the outlook, uh, what we are saying is that uh, if the borders reopen, uh, a roaming revenue can immediately return. So this is like an ups upside optionality, not priced into the stock, and they are giving a guidance of $0.05. Cents. So, uh, which is basically they're paying you a 4% yield. And then the two upside is if the roaming revenue will return and, and the next one is, uh, is the cybersecurity, which I'll mention later. So in terms of our view, you maintain neutral uh, because we haven't changed, uh, target price is unchanged. Uh, but, but there's upside rationality is because uh, if roaming comes in, which we haven't really kind of put into our forecast and also cybersecurity. So, you know, right now cybersecurity is basically valued like a telco. Uh, but if it, if they do something about it, I know we're not sure. They haven't really mentioned. But if there is, if they kind of like, there's some corporate exercise, I'm not sure if they want the IPO or whatsoever. Then the cyber security alone could be you know worth more than just that six times EV EBITDA. I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Uh, next. Yeah. Okay. I'll just just very quickly because uh, in terms of the the macro news, nothing much. Just the the taxi. The number of taxis was down 52 units or so. It seems to be slowing down the taxi fleet, the, the, the decline. Used to be almost 200 taxis uh, falling a, a month. Now it's about 50. Uh, uh, I won't run through much, but in terms of the US, the main one was the inflation, which we'll show you later. So uh, later I'll discuss on the SEMCOP uh, Marine update. And uh, because Terence was away, and then uh, the SPH revised offer briefing uh, before this morning's offer. So in terms of technical views, I guess there's a bit of a speed bump here because inflation is surging far ahead. Inflation in the US now is about 30 year highs. Uh, in terms of our points will be now, so uh, we will have two this week, uh, Cecil and AE, uh, AEM. And we will also have a US uh, Marathon Digital on the 30th. So uh, this is a Bitcoin miner. So if you want the second largest in the US, I guess listed, if you have... I guess if you want to learn more, uh, want to understand more about Bitcoin mining, then maybe this is the, the event for, for you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, this is nothing much, just an update on COVID cases. It's just moving sideways. I think the, the table on the right, you can just see that the German cases actually record high now. And of, of course, of course we've seen from the press, I mean, the Europeans are now imposing a bit of lockdowns so again. Uh, next slide. 
uh, I think this is Singapore lah. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I think I won't go through this. This is update. Uh, okay. Then this the table on the left is just core inflation, excluding uh fuel and food. I mean, sometimes you're not sure why. Like because just, uh, those two are very volatile. But no, I guess we all need, still need fuel and fuel, but it, it's excluded. But what it means is that the uh, this is the highest still thirty years. So I'm not sure how transient this is gonna be. And even con is even the high inflation is also affecting consumer sentiment in the US, uh, whereby you no know, uh the people are a bit worried of their purchasing power because inflation is just running too far ahead of their wage growth. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'll, I'll just run through the briefing we had on with Sam Cop Marine for those who uh, were not not able to attend, and because this talk is so heavily traded, so we will just give you a bit of update. <clears throat> So in terms of Samcorp Marine, uh, some updates is that the rights issue is done. The offer by Thermasic at eight cents is over, and Thermasic now owns fifty four point six percent. The capital deal they said uh, there's a mutual due diligence ongoing, and they are still working towards a potential combination. In terms of the outlook, it looks good because uh, these are the potential projects they mentioned. Uh, feed contract for combo FPS load. So, so what it means is that uh, feed is a, uh, is basically you no know, front end design. That means before the project actually gets implemented, uh, Samcorp Marine is involved. You know the design work of this FPSO, and and this is positive because Samcorp won't do enter a feed or do this such do all this work if they can't get the EPC, which is the, the actual construction order book. So once they enter FIT, what I'm trying to say is that they got high chance of getting this project because uh, they only do the FIT if they can get the job. So what they're waiting for is this thing called FID, which is basically the end customer, some of the all majors uh, um, um, fi finally making a decision. on. So if you hear any FID news on these two FPSO, Cambo and Dorado, uh, uh, then the you could you will look good for Sam in terms of getting uh, new con new orders. The other order that they're looking at is a is a Brazil for their Brazilian yacht. This Navy contract as a support vessel. I think that is also their exclusive. If I'm not mistaken, there's also a uh, ten tender project. So the project looks good. Uh, and in terms of the outlook, what they said was number one, second half will still be loss making. Uh, number two, uh, I think they reiterated many times that uh, the, there's an improvement, improving business outlook and order visibility. Uh, number three, even rigs are starting to come out from coal stack, but unlikely to get any orders because I think all the all majors, well, I think the priority is producing oil rather than going no, no, no rather than go explore for new oil. So I guess that is probably less likelihood. Probably the FPSO renewables will be the likely projects. Uh, the fourth update is the workers are returning to the yard and, and that is good because they also lost some repair work because there's lack of workers. And like mentioned earlier, when they participate in the feed, which is the design part of the of the FPSO, uh, uh, they only do it if they think they have visibility to get the contract. Uh, so quite obvious that they will, should be able to get the, these contracts. So the, the I guess in conclusion for SAMCOP, they are getting this uplift. There's an investment cycle right now for the renewables and also for you no know, traditional oil and gas energy, I guess. Uh, the table on the right is just an update on, on their order books. Uh, obviously, it's really low right now, probably a record low for many, many years. Uh, next, next slide. Okay, this is just my last two slides. Okay, this was the this was the tender offer by Keppel before this morning's uh Cascaden or Ombing Singh's group's or, 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 or offer. But uh, anyway, just one quick one. So the offer by Keppel was $2.35. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So the new offer now is two dollars thirty six in cash, or two dollars forty cents in cash and SPH units. Uh, so I guess there's no capital units here. So just one last thing for me is that there's an important date. Uh, the most important date I I guess is the first of December. So. Someone else, so they can still be a uh, so uh, for cap from Keppel, they mentioned that their offer was final. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but if since they say final, so very unlikely they will make another offer. So the timeline is that, uh, that on the 8th December, there will still be a meeting for investors, shareholders to reject um, Cascaden offer, which is obvious. I mean, there's a, a cash 236. So, so it's very likely you get you will you would get rejected. But there's an important date here, which is the 1st of December. Uh, because of this scheme, uh, it's a bit technical, but we, we, before, before the, this scheme meeting, 
is there's if there's any cash offer out there by uh, I don't know third party or whoever. Um, again, I'm no idea, but anyone who wants to put another offer, cash or which is a general offer, has to be announced by the first of December. So by the first of December, if that there is no offer, means I think there's no more offers on on the line. But again, I need to confirm that because there's a two p.m. meeting. But this is just to give you some important timeline. So once they reject the offer, then uh, you can see the one on the in the blue. Or sorry, if you can't see, but uh, early December they'll dispatch the documents for Cascadia and then they run the meeting. Then it should complete by the February of next year the Cascadia order offer. Okay, yeah, uh, that's what that's it for me. Uh, can okay, move on to questions. Thanks. Where I think it goes. Huh? Uh, anybody can hear me? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Hear you. Okay, sure. Um, okay, because my mic wasn't moving. Okay, so first up, we have the Rex International. So for Rex International, it has been a very spectacular uh, upside um, since the oil actually has, um, in the US, the, the light, light crude oil futures has really um, on the strong dollar upside, uh, as well as golden energy and followed by all these oil related counters uh, have some positive correlation. Uh, without further ado, um, let's move on. I, I think I shared about the oil counters um, back in our last uh, Q4 strategy outlook. So for right now, Rex has already gone up quite a fair bit. Um, right now we are looking at some consolidation. Uh, you can see that for the momentum, we have an oversold um, level above 89 uh, of the RSI level. So um, there's some sort of like a corrective kind of pattern um, forming right now. For the ADX, uh, the average directional um, index, um, trend has been on the on the downs the 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 trends the strength of the trend has been on the downside so right now we are really facing consolidation the lagging span of the ichimoku is showing like uh, a, a closer um um closer distance to the to the actual price at the candles over here so uh rex right now we are expecting a break to the upside um maybe um over the next two period next two weeks or also Based on the period, uh, first of all, prices have been trending down below the, the nine, nine period uh, line. And we are looking at a possible uh, retest of the support as 30 cents to 31.5 cents. Okay. So for silver egg access, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, the run up has been uh, the, the short, the midterm run up has been quite, quite fairly strong. Uh, just that price has uh, fails to re, re, uh, break the resistance zone too. Uh, we can see that there is a three wave kind of pattern, uh, three end wave, uh, which is the Sundan wave. Um, so there is a correction um, back to the resistance turn support zone at uh, 29 cents to 30 cents. Um, upside may not, we may not see any uh, further upsides at the moment yet um, based on this ADX and the RSI momentum. Uh, Ichimoku remain flat. I can see the lagging span is uh, trending nearer to the candle. Uh, Sengo span is sloping down. And uh, ADX can see that is is as trending below uh, 40. So once it breaks 20, we can see that uh, there's a further side of consolidation means that trend is weakening right now. Um, and we may see a price um, breaking to the downside um, or below resistance zone one. All right. So uh, these two counters, uh, we are looking at um, kind of like consolidation um, for the moment. So for UMS, UMS today did uh, fairly well. Okay, so uh, you have a break, uh, you have a measuring gap above the, the downward sloping line resistance. Um, price, but however, price is still testing at $1.43 resistance level. Um, is Everything seems good, all right. Um, the Ichimoku is showing strong uh, bullish uptrend uh, after a three wave down correction. So if this is successful, we should see a confirmation breaks above 
uh, $1.60 in the midterm to confirm the upside further. All right. Otherwise, uh, short term wise, uh, closure above two successive period closure above $1.43 uh, is likely a confirmation of the target. All right. So for next one will be Capital Land in the um, uh, cap, uh, CICT, sorry. Okay, so ascending triangle has been relatively successful breaks up, but uh, looking at the momentum of, of the of the candles, uh, long shadows, uh, high wave candles on on nine of November, um, is is signified that you no know, price is not very strong at the moment. Uh, despite prices has been testing two dollar twenty cents psychological resistance level, um, the breaking out of the upside. Um, it, is, it, it, it might not come as early as we, we think it is. So there may be a, uh, a, a, a false breakout, uh, 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 means aka a bull trap. Um, price may, may you know, uh, just come back to $2.03 to $2 before rebound to the upside. Okay. So this is what I have for CICT. All in all, it remains a range. You look at Ichimoku, um, is is kind of like range bound despite the, the second span it rising, but you know, um, price is not exhibiting strong um, momentum at the moment. So, uh, either we wait for a breakout above two dollar twenty cents, or we look we 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 look for a rebound at two o three to two uh, two dollars for now. Uh, ARA Hospitality Trust momentum is um, weak despite you know um, ADX showing a break above forty uh, on July, uh, but you know um, the, the 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 downside of the consolidation, the trend weakening is indicating that ARA there is not any uh, volatility or um, pro, um, momentum going on forward for that. Um, back to ESRE. ESRE has been uh, quite a, a relatively a strong one, especially it breaks off the resistance zone of the larger ascending triangle. Um, banner has been broken, so but the upside uh, remain a range bound uh, effect. So, um, anything you we really really need to see a fifty cents um, break up to the upside. Um, ADX is showing a, a, a turn of a signal above uh, at twenty point. So we might they might be seeing a, a return of the trend to the upside uh, again. Okay, um, let's look at the Ichimoku. Um, not not much of the signal uh, that can be provided. So for ESRE, uh, we are we from the technical point of view, uh, we are actually not very confident of any upside at the moment. So like like I say mentioned at the start of the part, ESR really need to break fifty cents to confirm the upside. All right. So for Wilma, Wilma, uh, initially we were, we were very hopeful, uh, especially breaks off the pattern, um, pattern of consolidation pattern upside. Uh, but the the rejection of the uh, shooting star, all right, below two hundred day moving average, uh, has caused price to have a consecutive uh, sell down back to the support zone around four three two to four three zero and four two nine. Um, this, if you go into a lower time frame, this seems like a bearish kind of flag consolidation. So, uh, there is a possibility that um, there is a, a true wave pattern down back to the lower support uh, boundary at four dollar and thirteen cents. Uh, moving forward, so and ADX is showing a a, a slow of down um going down again. So, um. It, all in all, we are seeing like a consolidative kind of pattern over here. Um, another thing is if there is another like further consolidation and fails to break four dollar and forty five cents or and four dollar and fifty cents, then there is a a a, 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 a like a long term kind of like um consolidative head and shoulder, which which if if is formed, you will actually threaten the 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 um, potential upside structure going forward. Okay, so if you look at the wave count theory, all right, uh, that's something I saw it just now. One, two, three. Uh, this complex corrective five, and then there's A, B, and C uh, going down. So this is like a sub five wave pattern. You can uh, take it as a look uh, from the Sundan point of view, uh, Hanka B kind of view is uh, we have a full. Um, uh, full like you know uh, a nine bars pattern so uh, the next one should be around you know uh, 
17, 18, 17 bars, and then uh, we should see another downside to uh, 26 days um, before that. So right now, uh, we still have a long-term way to, to decide what will happen to Wilma. This is like the, the Ichimoku, the Hankabi, kind of like a day of change uh, period that we are estimating to have. So let's move on to AEM. AEM, I did have a report on, I think, July, August. Um, I posted a follow-up link on, on the, my Telegram channel. So you guys may check it out. Uh, all in all, the upside has returned. Um, you see that Ichimoku has been close on the upside, uh, but but we are approaching the um, oversold level at above 80. So um, any anything, we will see a correction touches $5 or maybe $5.01 uh, before correction down to test the support, uh, immediate support, uh, immediate resistance to support at $4.75. All right, so um, there is like some, maybe some six, um, three or four more periods going on the upside, but um, the upside may, may actually slow down uh, based on the volume and volatility. Um, next one is source uh, susurrate, susurrate uh, inverted head and shoulder V bottom, or you can say a, a cup and handle kind of pattern has already broken up uh, above the resistance at 865 and 875. Uh, today, there's opening gap uh, above, so uh, we are testing 90 cents for now. Uh, but we are looking at the next um, resistance is actually at this level, uh, 0 0.915 to... Uh, 0 0.930 uh, going forward. So there may be a correction uh, coming up. Um, looking at the Ichimoku, we are we are we are sure. So once it break up of the Kumo, then there is a Kumo bullish Kumo twist where Senko span A cross above the B zone, uh, the the span B. So that will be forming a three golden cross uh, going forward. So uh, looking at ADX, there is some sort of like a, a, a recovering of the, the, the trend momentum. So yep, everything seems um, all right for now. But I would say that um, the upside will just looking at uh, a correct corrective back to the downside uh, before heading up to the upside again. Uh, long term wise, we look at a weekly chart um, minus of the Ichimoku. Uh, we are looking at um, target uh, F one dollar over the long term. Okay, so uh, for Thai Bev, Thai Bev upside has been uh, going relatively well, um, but the ADX uh, was seen pick up, but has already sluggish off. Um, the we have some sort of like a, a double kind of divergence going on. So uh, any upside, uh, we need to see the break above 80 oversold um, to confirm, to, to eliminate the threat of the uh, bearish um, downside of the bearish divergence. Okay. So for 9CI, for Capital Land Investment Trust, um, upside initially was good. I shared about the pattern pattern um, back at, you know, 3.3 uh, to 3.35 has been the powerful support zone. Uh, it, it did break out of the pattern, but um, the pattern resistance top at 3.54 wasn't, $3.54 wasn't that uh, sustained enough. Um, price immediately came down, you know, and then there was correction uh, right end. So now we are facing consolidation. ADX wise, you can see a huge dip. Um, divergence can be seen over here. Um, divergence uh, can be seen over here. So uh, we are we are expecting some uh, some price momentum to test three dollars thirty cents to three dollars thirty five cents. Um, city development. Okay, so uh, since we have finished a standard wave of the three end wave pattern, um, descending triangle may or may not push price to the upside, but I favor more to the downside um, to $3.94, a true wave pattern down. So something in this way um, that may be a false breakout and then down and before um, going forward to, to retest to the upside at $8.04 to $8.19 uh, going forward. Uh, last but not least, I think I have the um, um, BYD company. So BYD, there was a pattern pattern I shared um, with Har uh, with La Harami look a light pattern, but you know price didn't um, price was uh, open with a bearish downside uh, below the Tenkan Sen. So uh, we might be seeing a flag instead of a pattern, and we may be looking at three dollars uh, two six one point four. Um, before we, we head up to the upside again. All right, so um, that's all for that. Um, and yeah, um, maybe 
I will do a, a, a TA in banks um, for that. So um, I will do 039 and then I'll do DBS uh, for that. So for OCBC, um, price still remains, you know, um, unable to break the $12 region. Uh, so we expect some sort of like a, a, a deeper pullback um, to, to this um, neckline resistance turn support at $11.59 to $11.66 uh, going forward uh, over here. Um, there is a chance that if it breaks uh, $11.86, then we are seeing a premature um, bullish trend to the upside. All right, uh, DO5 for DBS. DBS um, upside has been secured uh, with price uh, actively staying above the, the resistance support at 31.76 and then uh, psychological resistance at $32. Uh, piercing line was good. And then there is a potential another high of piercing line. So we should see a, a momentary upside to target $34 um, going forward. And last but not least, I think UOB uh, has been relatively performing well. Um, um, we expect some sort of uh, uh, target above um, a, a mid-term target to $28.63. All right, so um, that's all uh, for now. Um, I'll pass my time to a colleague due to uh, time. Time. If there is an additional time, yes, I will, I will continue to do. But otherwise, I will, I will just type my answer in. All right, so um, back to you, Paul, and the rest of you guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we, we, whichever uh, technical answer you just uh, delete it. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me just run through some questions. Uh, could you quantify the impact of NF, NRFF2 in terms of earnings accretion and timeline? Example, earnings accretion percentage in first N years, earnings drag, any unforeseen unseen financial benefits like lower discount rate, less visibility, lower. Is NRF2 net positive or net? Uh, so, so uh, th thanks for the question. Uh, NRFF2 is, is a net positive uh, of 15 million. The reason why, you know, it's hard for us to model anything because we don't have details. Uh, we don't have details. What is the revenue shortfall? They don't tell us. Uh, because to do a, a complete computation, uh, we need to know uh, what is the arrangements they have with LTA? What is the revenue shortfall? What is the service fee? So uh, there is very little details that they give even before the, this restructuring and, and of course even now. So very hard to kind of do a computation, but you can take the 15 million uh, because that's all they gave as the compensation they will get uh, for FY20 and maybe this year, maybe 10 million if assuming the, uh, sorry, the 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 number of uh, train rides is worse, is less worse than last year because train rides actually improved 2021. So that should be the range. Uh, again, it's very hard because Everything is very confidential, so they don't give us a lot of details. Yeah. Uh, I, I, sorry, I, I hope I helped you on that part. Um, the next one is the sudden movement in AEM. Uh, Vivian, can you help? I didn't really attend. I, I think they raised their guidance, but I'm not sure. Uh, Vivian, if you can. Uh, as we wait for uh, the next one is are there hidden reasons for Comfort Douglas IPO hot besides valuation? Is the IPO halted indefinitely or likely revived in 2022? Are there are there other strategic uh, options? Uh, they didn't, they only said that, that the Australian market is now more focused on tech listings. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's not only for Australia. So I think they just couldn't get the valuations that they wanted. I don't think it will be revived in 2022. Uh, again, it's unclear unless you know, suddenly the market is willing to give higher valuations. So I don't think they, I think the whole process started because uh, when they were on roadshows, or they were getting some good feedback from Australian investors that this thing should be should be listed. So they they tried, but I think eventually the investment makers said that it, it's not materializing as they hope. Yeah. Strategy options, um, not sure, but I think more likely they will want to acquire rather than sell the Australian operations. Their plan is to grow it even bigger. Uh, how about what the startup do on cybersecurity to earn the revenue? Okay. Um. Okay. Firstly. The problem we have is that Starhub don't really give details they, they, because they don't tell, but the main customer are government agencies and also large corporates. So some of the general things they do is like threat intrusion. So you can think of them like the cybersecurity consultant to the, you know, I don't know, government agency or corporates. And from there, 
they can just on sell, they can do threat surveillance, do surveillance work for them, do projects to improve their security. This is as best as we get. They never don't they don't give details of the value, they don't give exact names of the customers, but they just give us these are the general. Uh, but they are well very well known. Uh. I mean, those who are in the industry will know that Ensign is the leader. And you no, know, Ensign is by the way 40% owned by Tomasic. So I guess it helps when you want to to target government government jobs. Uh, okay, I'm just setting through. Uh, uh, thanks, Paul, uh, for the webinar. What happens to SPH read? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what happens to SPH read after the compulsory acquisition chain listing offer on 965 offered to SPH read union holders? Will SPH read be delisted or taken private? On the other hand, will Cascade and Pink offer a higher price? Okay, uh, what happens is that it, it, it is a bit of scenarios because uh, because this Cascade and offer, there are two parts, right? There's Shares and there's cash. Um, okay. Uh, let me let me just share the 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 screen. Uh, yeah, that's a, that, that's just bear with me. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I will just share the screen very quickly. So, if you look at this uh, again, I'm waiting for the two p.m. briefing. But let me just share. So, uh, Cascade offer has two parts. So one is cash and shares. Uh, cash and then the shares here, and the other one is all cash. So if there's all cash, then means Cascaden will hold more than thirty percent of SPH read. So they have to trigger a, a, a offer, and based on the takeover laws, uh, takeover offer, what it means is that they have to uh, make an offer, which is like I think the the VWAP, the the volume weighted price of the twenty days when the offer was made. Again, that's another scenario. I mean, when because we're not sure which offer will run. I mean, most likely everybody take this up, but again, it's very unclear. So in the meeting, we also need to know why it's a 50-50 and all that. So we're not really sure. But if it's all cash and it, it is more than 30%, then they have to make an offer for SPH Street. And it's likely going to be, I don't think it'll be a very astronomical, uh, I don't think it'll be really high price because it's going to be the last few traded price. I think that was going to be the offer made. Yeah, I, I hope that that, that helps. Uh, uh, again, I'm just sharing as much as, as I as I have right now, yeah. Thanks, yeah. So, so there's two parts. Uh, it has to be a cash offer, and then uh, it will be basically the last thirty, the last twenty days volume weighted VVAT price. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the market share of Propnex compared to Apex Reality? What's the outlook for Propnex next year? Um, they don't give the. I think the market share is is like. Well, 45, 40 or something. It, uh, Apex, to be to be fair, Apex Realities market share has crept up very strongly uh, this year. Uh, but because of the size, right, so Propnex is still the larger com company. And I think more important is that the market share becoming more concentrated with the two. So it's the third and the, the I think Orange Tea and, and, and Hutton's, that's the one that's losing market share. So these two continue to be stronger and stronger because more and more agents go to them because of the support they get because of scale, right? If you launch an IT solution, you can offer 9,000 agents versus 2,000 or 4,000. So it's, uh, for me, it's not so much both competing. It's more like they're taking share from the, the other two smaller ones. Um, the outlook for next year, I think will be slower. I think uh, because I'm worried the new launches, that basically not enough units uh, because all the inventory developers, Inventory used to be three years now down to what, no no one and a half years, so we, really there's not much inventory until the the GLS and and more, uh sorry more inbox sales. So I think volumes should be slower for next year because fewer new launch sales. But uh, but uh, so uh, so but no, these guys are still going to be very attractive uh, uh, use, I guess. Okay. Um. Sorry. Let me let me try to answer. Uh. There's a lag in slides and verbal presentation. Yeah. Sorry for that. Yeah. The, I'm, I'm not sure what's your view of UOB APEC Green ETF. Any potential upside? Sorry, I'm not very familiar with this. Can you recommend a China Asian ETF to take advantage of the market sell-off? Uh. Viren, do you know of any? Um, sorry, I, I couldn't uh, open up my Q&A tab. Um, what was the question on the... Uh, can you recommend a China or Asian ETF to take advantage of market sell-off? That means, uh, I, I don't know, a leverage ETF, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah, it will be the leverage inverse, inverse ETF. Or... But the, the, the fact that inverse ETF is um, uh, there's a time decay you need to take on 
off. So uh, rather like, you know, uh, this is my personal opinion, uh, rather take on using a CFD or options to actually catch a market. Um, that will be a better, uh, lower cost and lower risk. Uh, of course, leverage is all shorts, all, all kind of shorts position using derivatives has a margin and leverage position. So yeah, you do need to take note of that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, if, but if you know of any, then yeah, okay. Never mind. Um, a quick question uh, regarding SPH Cascadian. Are the SPH read distribution existing units or oh, it's existing units? So, uh, is the distribution of SPH uh, existing shares in in SPH read? Yeah. The the, the means because SPH read owns I think forty five. Uh, SPH owns forty five percent of SPH read, so they have to dis they will distribute those shares. And also, is SPH3 expected to correct downwards after the chain offer? Uh, on paper, uh, yeah, on paper, it will if if investors elect to take the SPH read because then people might, might there might be a bit of overhang on uh SPH uh, SPH read. Uh, so I'm just looking at this. <laughs> yeah, there, there could be a bit of overhang because if I'm a SPH shareholder now, I I'll take the SPH read shares. Uh, I mean to catch to realize my two two forty in value. I definitely want to sell it. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah. So that could be some overhang uh, if that happens. Another overhang is also IFAS uh, because I'm not sure what Cascadian wants to do with the IFAS shares when they own uh, SPH. Yeah, I hope that answers it. Yeah, but I will try and give you better uh, details after the two pm briefing today. Yeah. Uh, hi Paul, in your view, which STI component have the most alpha against STI? Um, which one? <laughs> I, I think it highest alpha. I curiously it could be the Jardin stocks, or maybe yeah. Because if Indonesia reopen more aggressive, then the Jardin group companies would, could be the one that will benefit the most. The reopening, because Indonesia is one of the worst hit, so that those could be the ones of the Jardin medicine. The, um, yeah, the whole Jardin group could be the ones. I, I think like, within the STI components, not my own guess. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, any stocks? Not necessarily the most alpha. Uh, uh, we are, you know, we are restricted to all our, to all, the, the, uh, uh, okay, we also attended Silver Lake. Uh, so, um, Although we don't cover, but I think there, there's a big investment cycle underway. So as you know, Silver Lake is, uh, is, uh, is they, they sell uh, software to the banks. I mean, very simple. So there's a big investment up cycle now for the banks uh, because after two years, because the last two years, uh, you know, banks, uh, maybe you're going to ask a bank to upgrade the software. That's the last thing to, worry, to think about because they were all worried about bad debts, low moratoriums. But now that these are a bit more, a bit over, so I think... Guys like Silver Lake could be getting a big investment uh, upcycle in in, in in IT infrastructure, especially now that it, there are more and more digital banks are coming up. So there could be a bit of pent up demand for that. Yeah. I'm just sharing you uh, because I was in the call, but just I had no time to work. Yeah. yeah, but I know we are all restricted to our uh, our best picks are I guess in our uh, our what do you call it the absolute ten uh, uh, model portfolio. Okay, um, I'm not sure this, uh, your view on UOB, APEC, I'm so sorry, I didn't go through the details because it's a very hectic week, so I don't have the details, but I think you can ask our salespeople. Oh, sorry, this one, uh, is it better to invest in SBS Transit rather than Comfort Delgo? Oh, of course, uh, SBS Transit, because SBS Transit, you don't have to worry about taxi, you don't have to worry about Grab, right? But the problem is the volume is so thin, and so that's why we always just work on Comfort Delgo. Because this one is like, uh, Comfort they'll grow without worrying about grab competition. So uh, yeah, so so on paper, I mean SDS transit would be the better alternative. But of course the volume is totally different. So that's why we always only and that's why we only cover comfort they'll grow. Okay, uh Vivian, you you can help out. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, again on the twenty uh, third, uh, yeah, sorry, just to remind everyone, twenty third, there's an AEM briefing, so you can also ask that. But uh, uh Vivian, uh, if you able to help out, yeah, thanks. Yeah, maybe just to touch a bit on the AEM question. Uh, what is the catalyst for the sudden movement in the in the in 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 AEM? So basically, for three Q, um, 
they did provide a higher revenue guidance. So in the first half of 2Q, uh, they, were, they mentioned the revenue guidance for FY21 was 460 to 520 million uh, Sing dollars. And for 3Q, um, they raised it to between 525 to 550 million. And um, the revenue for achieved already for nine month 21 is about 338 million Sing dollars. So you can say that they are guiding for a very strong 4Q um, on the back of a very strong demand. And also they also mentioned that they are managing the component shortage situation well. Yeah, hope that helps. Thank you. Um, Vivian, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but maybe uh, since you went UMS, I just wonder if you have anything, uh, of course, more details next week, but any, anything that caught your eye for UMS? Um, not anything in particular, because uh, I think they mentioned a lot of the technical parts on the types of technology, but I think it's just that they uh, mentioned that they have been effective in mitigating the component shortage situation and able to procure the supplies um, when it's appropriate at the appropriate price. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, Timothy, again, sorry for you for anything on components since you were in the meeting early, about 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay, okay, let me just get some. Yeah, just to uh, share with everyone, because we just had this meeting, so we just try and give you whatever updated info we have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the lead times are obviously much higher, so it can be up to one year. Uh, and everyone is experiencing the shortages. This is, this is in particular to China. So there's very, it's very hard to find alternatives uh, to get the supply from anywhere else. But, and, and the smaller, and the smaller uh, companies are more affected by the larger, uh, than the larger ones like Apple and Samsung. Uh, so, in particular, the, the shipping conditions now is also affecting the supply, but the, the shipping component is not really affecting the financials so much of the companies because, because they, don't, they don't have enough supply to ship in the, in the first place. Uh, anything else? Mm. And current, okay, then the, the main point for, for what we got from the call just now is that um, the, the, the companies are able to raise the prices now because purchases, buyers, cust customers are looking just to get the quantity of uh, the items that they need and not really looking at price anymore. It, so so they are, in other words, they are looking to pay like any prices for, for the quantity that they need. So the suppliers are able to raise their prices uh, more to their customers. So they're, they're better. the suppliers will be able to handle this situation better than the customers. That's the color that we got. Okay, thank, thanks Timothy. Um, I will try to answer this last two before maybe we can, we can end it. What are your thoughts on Big Plus? With their sharing last week. Uh, okay, okay, it's so sorry. I mean, we didn't have time to do because there's so many results, right? But we'll try and do it maybe next week. But uh, just some general views. We don't cover Big Plus, but Big Plus is, is a bit unusual. Uh, they have building with Singapore, they're selling pipes and selling plastic pipes in Singapore and also uh, medical products, right? So, but of course, the medical products is a real jewel because uh, medical products is number one. Uh, the medical products they do. It's like some of them are put, uh, like like stands. Uh, sorry, like like uh, hand mesh. That means uh, it's inside your body, and some of them stays permanently inside your body. So these are really high end products. Number one, number two, they are the sole supplier for medical products. And number number three, uh, once you are selected as a medical uh, equipment producer, they will stick with you until the end of life of the product. So uh, I, I think they got very, uh, without stating the obvious, a very good uh, medical. Uh, uh, product business, but again, I'm not sure the valuation and so forth. For, so I think if they were to just list that, I think the share price should should, should do very well because this is a really, it's a big jewel. I think yeah, to have this medical that's been almost thirty years, yeah, uh, yeah. Th that's my thoughts. I mean, we try and do more details uh, next week. I uh, so, sorry, I don't have that much. Yeah, on straight trading, another question. Uh, the book value is about uh, with the completion. 
of the deal, I think the book value with the ARA, I think there is about five dollar plus, and I think you can just expect a big big dividend coming up from them. Uh, I I forgot what was my competition, but if uh, I I think they can give out all the cash, and they probably like a eight cents special dividend or eighteen cents. Yeah, I need to check my notes, but but uh, but that's my view. Let me go and uh, double check. Uh, yeah. Uh, so sorry. Uh, can someone just take some of the questions, Mister? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Ned, can you take on the phrases property question? Is there any? Uh, hi, I'll take, I'll take the question on United Hampshire first. So for United Hampshire, um, overall, the portfolio is very stable due to the kind of assets that they hold, uh, namely your strip malls as well as your um, uh, self-storage kind of assets. Uh, the occupancy remains quite high, uh, about 96.7%. So of course, um, these these strip malls they are very similar to the kind of like suburban malls um but but um, in a sense where they are they benefit from a lot of essential essential spend spending or essential driven necessity driven kind of spending yeah um as well as um yeah so during the during this um, most recent announcement or rather update they announced the, that they will be acquiring uh, two other they've completed the acquisition of two other um, assets um, that, yeah, so which is um, Penrose Plaza as well as Colonial Square in Pennsylvania and Virginia, respectively. Yeah. So, so these two, these two um, new new um, retail developments will contribute uh, from the next quarter onwards. And so, overall, I think that the portfolio for you, United Hampshire, is stable. Yeah. Uh, for. Okay, I think that okay. Let me just quickly run through this. Then uh, one more two. Then we I think we, we can we can end it. Uh, okay. In terms of the switch trading, uh, the gain from the whole deal is a big seven hundred million. Uh, it is possible they could pay even as much as uh, thirty cents per share. But I mean the share price is three something. They could even pay a thirty cents uh, uh, special dividend uh, if they wanted to. Uh, because they're collecting one billion uh, in shares and uh, and uh, one hundred million. If you think of the cash component, they're collecting hundred million, and you just use it to pay off. Uh, they they could pay uh they could pay off almost thirty cents in 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 dividend. 
because the gain is huge, almost 700 million gain from, from the disposal of uh, ARA uh, to, to, to ESR. Uh, and their book value is about 550. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, there could be some upside. I mean, yeah, just to answer that, that question. Um, let me just answer the taking, taking reference from the previous rate hike cycle by the Fed. The Fed took four years to hike before they stop and reverse the trend. Will this trend remain the same moving forward? I don't, I don't think the rate hike will be so aggressive. I think because the amount of leverage now in the system is probably much higher. But I think the the current Fed posture is just to take it as dovish as they can and only hide if they are put in the corner. So that's a bit worrying too. But I don't think the rate hike cycle will be so uh, aggressive because they have to bear in mind the you know, the, the amount. Because if you rate hike, not only do you get hit by the amount of leverage in, in the uh, and, and, and it will shave off some some of the 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 growth because you are you are leverage hundred percent right so you take out one percent increase you're taking out one at least one percentage point of growth and then number two you, the impact on the US dollar they also have to worry if you raise if you hike too much then you might hit the US dollar and there will also be another deflation hit for the economy and then number three because uh, I guess in a way most of this is supply constraint so if you rate you will hike too fast you might be a bit premature because uh, these are all supply constraints and then in one year's time, hopefully some of this could disappear. So uh, I, we don't think that the hike cycle will be similar because of all these things to consider. Yeah. Uh, again, all, all this is almost like guesswork. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I think, uh, the, uh, let's take the last one. Any risk to tie branch from rising raw material costs? I... I think near term, no. I think the last call we had, they've kind of hedged quite a, a, a lot of it. And, and materials, uh, if it moves also, it moves very uh, minor. I mean, maybe one, two percentage points because they can cover by cutting their sales and marketing costs. That's where most of the benefit is. And, and also, they can also raise prices. I think the more worrying thing is, is the reopening uh, because they are, it's more the reopening that is more critical. So I, I don't think the raw material impact can be can be offset you know, by raising prices since most peers are doing it anyway. Yeah. Uh, but I'll yeah, that's my own thinking. They should be releasing the results by end of this month. Okay, I think we hit 12.30. Uh, I think most of the questions. Uh, Yang Chichang update into uh, MSCI. Sorry, I'm not, not very don't really have much color on that. Uh, Parkway read you. You have anything, um, Natalie? Yeah. Parkway read. Uh, okay, for Parkway read, I think uh, most of you know it's a very very um stable kind of stock. So it has performed well post COVID. Um, I think it's up by about thirty over percent. Uh, price uh from a price uh comparison. Um, and also I think uh because of this up, uh riding up in price, the dividend yield is actually quite uh low, about two point two point seven. Uh, if I'm not wrong, the forward dividend yield. So um, that, that means that dividend yield spread wise is about 1%. So I'm, I mean, uh, I think for some investors, you might find it unattractive given the very low dividend yield. But I guess um, the, the, the upside is that it's always going to be quite stable. Um, in terms of buy, sell, hold, um, we don't have coverage on this counter. Um, however, I think that there are there are other counters that are, uh, you know, stable, stay relatively stable in nature, um, and and you know, it might be, it might not be as, uh, you know, stable or counter cyclical as um, Parkway Life, but I think that if you look at the risk reward kind of profile, um, you know, you might you might actually find more value from holding other kinds of of uh, REITs with perhaps a dividend yield of like five, four four ish five percent, yeah. Uh, Okay, thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, so I have Paul. Uh, if your US dollar, uh, US height, US will go up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I kind of miss miss spoke that. Yeah, US dollar will go up, and and that's a deflationary shock uh, because when the US dollar goes up, it, it will come negatively impact the economy. Yeah, sorry for that. Maybe I, I spoke too fast. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ali help Ali Baba. Sorry, we we don't cover because you have to ask our Hong Kong side. Uh, do you expect to see improvement in startup price? I, I think there is potential uh, because when, when like, sorry, keep on talking about this, but once borders reopen, I mean, hopefully, who knows, especially China, which is going to be hard, but at least Malaysia, that's the two biggest market. 
you you get this you get this immediate jump in earnings. The earnings can just gap up when there's roaming, uh, but it's probably the later part of 2022. Yeah. So that's why we think there's upside risk uh, to the startup price, considering basically earnings are kind of bottom out. Okay, I, I think we won't run through. I think there's more or less it. A lot of it's like Disney City. Uh, if you want to know about, about the US, I think Viren has a 1 p.m. meeting. Uh, what's the impact of China's suppression of coal price? Yeah, it's, it's going to be negative for Geo. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really updated. Uh, hopefully, they give a briefing. Yeah, so uh, we, I don't have the latest updates now. I'm sorry for that. Okay, I, I think we, 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 can, we can end it. Uh, for some of the US questions, I think you can refer to our 1 p.m. meeting. Oh, okay, what about Singtel? Singtel, I'm not so optimistic. Uh, Singtel, ultimately, uh, we will, the results came out. It's more or less in line. We'll come up with a note later. But uh, what's helping them is really just in India is the one moving the needle for, for them. Yeah. And the dividend yield, is, they just get, it's all about the so We're not, so, not as upbeat of Singtel, although we have a higher uh, uh, recommendation because of the valuations. Yeah. Uh, but we'll try and give you an answer next week with more details because we still haven't released the report yet. Yeah, so sorry for that. But for me, I think the preference should be a star hub. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks everyone. I think we have to have to go. Uh th thanks for your for, for your time. Yeah. Sorry, some of the questions we can't really answer. We need time to go and study it, the data. Yeah. So sorry we can't answer every question for you. Yeah. Anyway, thank, thanks so much, everyone. Uh hope you have a good week ahead and uh, do join us for some of the webinars uh, if, if you do have the time. Yeah. So thanks again. Yeah, just go to our phone's website. Thanks and uh, uh and, and take care everybody. Bye bye.